Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, good morning from Hatiai at Prince of Songkla University. Um, very nice to welcome all of you again. Uh, many, many participants on Zoom. Um, we're back again today um, for another talk by Professor Peter da Costa, who is with us today. Still um, very, very honored to have him with us. Um, so we'll do we'll do a slightly different talk today, but um, similar kind of system to yesterday, if you already joined us. Um, we'll start with introduction, then um, Prof. Peter will, will uh, give his talk for about one hour. Yeah, and then after that, we're open for uh, Q&A, we're open for any comments, we'll, we're open for any kind of um, uh, discussion, questions. Um, and really, I would encourage the audience today to have questions and thoughts, um, because for the topic that we've uh, that we've set out today, we really have in the field of applied linguistics one of the one of the perfect people. Um, um, Peter de Costa yeah, is full professor in the Department of Linguistics, Languages and Cultures at Michigan State University. Um, he also runs the Master of Arts in TESOL. Um, and he's also working within the Second Language Studies PhD program at Michigan State. Um, Peter has degrees from uh, National University of Singapore and also from Nanyang Technological University, as well as from Harvard and PhD from University of Madison, Wisconsin in the US. He's worked at Michigan State University since 2013, and he was very recently promoted to a full professor for which we once again congratulate him. Um, now, his um, his area of work is very diverse. Um, he really covers the entire scope of applied linguistics. Um, he's written about world Englishes. He's written about CLIL. He's written about classroom discourse, language policy, research ethics, also language testing from a critical perspective. Um, and in particular, recently, he's focused on emotions in language teaching. Um, I will, um, there's really interesting work um, in, in Peter's opus. It's a very large opus. Uh, we just observed before in Scopus, 123 units of different kinds. So articles, book chapters, and, um, and different kinds of texts. Um, among these are um, papers in the very biggest journals, um, among them uh, System, Language Teaching Research, the Modern Language Journal, um, really, really a really broad array of work covering all of these topics. But the reason why Peter is also the perfect speaker to talk to us about publishing in Applied Linguistics today is because of his activity also as an editor. Peter at the moment is co-editor of TESOL Quarterly, which is one of the most highly rated journals in our field. Um, aside from that, he's also very experienced as an editor of special issues. Um, he's got 10 special issues in different journals out already out and four more in preparation. Um, as well as six edited volumes, um, so six edited books, edited collections of chapters, and four more in progress. Um, so in terms of, you know, today where the challenge for many academics is how do we, how do we fulfill the expectations of the universities um, to produce more and higher standard, I think Peter is, has really just the perfect insight for us to be able to see, um, for us to be able to make sense of um, our place, yeah? So with that introduction, yeah, I will ask Peter to um, start his talk. Thank you very much, Christoph, for the, the very generous introduction and for the invitation to, to be here at the Faculty of Liberal Arts, uh, Prince of Songkla University. Um, I'm very pleased to see that we have quite a sizable um number of participants on zoom i'm sorry i can't really see you but i know you're there <laughs> okay and i hope that you stay with us uh for the duration of the talk um i'm, I'm going to start right now and as and, and the key part of the talk today uh, i'll be drawing specifically also from my 
uh, experience being the editor of TESOL Quarterly. And some of you might know the journal. Uh, it is the flagship journal of T TESOL International. Uh, there's another journal, T uh, TESOL Journal, um, which is our sibling journal, which is more pedagogically oriented. So if you are not familiar with either journal, you might want to check them out, TESOL Quarterly and TESOL Journal. All right, so let's kind of get started. Oops, once again, we are not moving. Oh, here we are, good. Um, so it's a three-parter, right, this talk. I'm going to start with the, the editor's perspective. I mentioned earlier that I co-edited this journal with my colleague uh, Charlene Polio at Michigan State. What you see here is the information that you will encounter when you visit the journal's website. Uh, we have different types of papers that we publish in our journal. And so we have several associate editors, like the brief reports editors, the reviews editors, um, teaching issues editor, and so on and so forth. So if you look at the um, any issue of Tissot Quarterly, you'll probably see a variety of articles. Of course, the main set of articles would be the featured articles, and that's what Charlene Polio and I oversee the featured articles. And then for the different uh, types of other articles, uh, we have our associate editors uh, taking care and managing the, uh, the process, the review process. All right. So, um, and, and I, why am I spending so much time on this slide? It's because almost any journal would have similar information up on your website. The roles might be slightly different, the titles might be slightly different, but in essence, they're all editors and associate editors. So do pay attention uh, to the editorial board. I'll come back to this point later in terms of being familiar with the composition of the editorial board as you think about which journal to submit your manuscript to. Okay, so I'm going to kind of move a little bit to open up the space a little here and, and talk about very quickly about global academic publishing. Many of us, of course, are under intense pressure increasingly to get our work published, right? Not only to keep our jobs, but also if we stay in our jobs to ensure that we have opportunities for promotion. And of course, with those opportunities come pay increases, right? We all want, of course, our salaries to go up. And so, so increasingly, as I said, there is the expectation for us to convert our research into publications. I'm not saying that conference presentations don't matter, but I think what we need to do is to make that important leap from conference presentation to publication. Um, it's important that you network at uh, conferences because as Christoph mentioned, it's like, how do I get my work published? Well, I think conferences are the first step, right? That's where you present your most recent findings. People come to your presentation. They learn about your research. I know you don't do justice to your research in 20 minutes of presentation, but you give them the highlights, right, in that sense. And then you get them hooked. To what you're doing and some people may come and they say oh i'm very interested in your study your study is quite similar to the study that i'm doing for example and i know i'm going a bit off target right now but i do want to make this point while i still can remember when you go to a conference that's where you network people pay attention to your research and when they pay attention to your research for example, an editor might come knocking on your door. She remembered your wonderful presentation from three months ago and she's editing a volume. Or she's editing a special issue of a journal and she might say, hey, I would like a contribution from someone from Thailand uh, or someone from the Philippines or a contribution from a colleague from China, right? That's where that lasting impression uh, makes a difference. Okay, and, and then it subsequently opens up a door for you to get your work published. That's one way to move forward from uh, conference presentation 
to eventual publication. So hold that thought, right? I think it's very important that you network and you build your own communities of, of practice in that sense. But let's go back to this idea of global academic publishing. And I'm going to use it China as an example. And I do know, uh, based uh, from the, the list of participants in our uh, Zoom call today or webinar that a number of uh, our participants today are colleagues from China. But having said that, China is an example that I'm giving today. And that the phenomenon of academic publishing is not particular or peculiar to China. It applies to many, many countries, including the US where I'm based right now. Okay, so this was, this study was done about eight years ago, uh, where there's an increasing culture of perish or publish. Some of you have heard that before, right? If you don't publish, your career will perish. Okay, and in that sense, so I'm not going to talk about the specific articles here, but but do look on the screen, uh, the different uh, research that has come out. Just looking at like publications and publishing in, in China specifically. All right. Um, the, what, what you see the left in the middle, the SSCI syndrome in higher education, among other things. This is an article that is somewhat, I'm going to minimize the screen here because it's uh, covering what I, I need to see. Okay. This is a study that was published in the journal Applied Linguistics in 2019. And the authors, uh, Lei and Liao, actually looked at uh, did, it, did a bib bibliographic analysis of uh, research trends in applied linguistics from 2005 to 2016. Um, you will see as we move from the left column to the right column, over a span of 10 years from say 2005 to 2016, uh, China uh, has impressively started to climb uh, the ranks, right, in, in that sense. And I think if we were to do a similar study today in 2024, I would think they would be even much higher on this rank uh, scale. Um, and, and that has to do partly with the fact that the government in China is very committed to ensuring that higher education is not only successful, but is world class, right? There is a uh, a very overt uh, strategy in a way to establish what they call um, first class disciplines and world class universities in China. So this is very much a concerted effort to to make sure that the universities there uh, do well, not just domestically but internationally, and and so part of that overall strategy of course is to to make sure that top creative talent are uh, attracted because many uh, many uh, chinese academics are also starting to return to china they might be trained in the uk or canada or the us and then they're going home and, and i know that for a fact because i've had quite a number of former phd students from china who after they completed their PhD at Michigan State, who have returned to China and doing excessively well right now in that respect. And, and of course, there's also a, a strong commitment to promote international exchanges there in, in China with world-class universities with the goal uh, to strengthen international collaboration and also uh, to attract foreign students. And the COVID kind of changed things a little bit, but I think uh, we're back on track. We're slowly, slowly kind of restoring the original intent here. Um, every year when I update this slide, <laughs> Tsinghua University and Peking University of Beta keep climbing and climbing, you know. Um, so you can see in the top 100 universities, according to Times Higher Education, Tsinghua is now at 12. They're very much a science-oriented engineering university. And Beta or, or Beijing University is at 14, right? And see where they where these universities are kind of situated. Like uh, Beijing University is in between the University of Chicago uh, in the US and Johns Hopkins uh, University also in the US. So this is the reality. University ranking matters, right? Wherever you are, universities, university administrators want to make sure that the ranking of the universities either is sustained or 
preferably improves over time. And of course, that's where we get the pressure to publish or perish. And this is a phenomenon, as I said, that's international. It's not specific to any country. So, uh, about three years ago, I, I guess that it's a special issue, and Christoph had mentioned that I've lost count in the number of case, uh, special issues I've worked on. But uh, this was one of the special issues that I worked uh, on with my colleagues, uh, Joseph Park and Lionel Wee at the National University of Singapore. And so the, the topic of the special issue that was published by Multilingua was uh, linguistic entrepreneurship. That's a separate talk altogether. Uh, but what I want to do is say very briefly about what our study. This was a study that I did with my former PhD student Wendy Lee or Li Wenqing, and she's now at at Kunshan Duke University in in China, just outside of uh, Shanghai. So what what we found, of course, in our study was that we had a visiting scholar from China, and he was with me. I was the host for one year for several years, and 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 he used that time very uh, strategically. And, and very remarkably, right, productively to make sure that he worked on his publications. It was kind of like a sabbatical for him, but he was working throughout, okay? And when you read this article, I'm going back one slide, it tells us uh, about his experience. He was one of two Chinese visiting scholars, right? It tells us about the experience uh, at his university where, let's put it this way, faculty were highly incentivized to make sure that their work was published in uh, SSEI and uh, in um, Chinese um, indexed uh, journals. Okay, so if you're interested to find out more about this, I strongly refer you to this article uh, that appeared three years ago in Multilingua. I'm now going to talk about things from an editor's uh, perspective, uh, specifically the perspective of an editor of TESOL Quarterly. In 2003, that's just over 20 years ago, Carol Chappelle and Tricia Duff um, worked on an article that you see on the left. It was published as part of a research issues section. And, and what they did was, Chappelle and Duff, they edited this, this piece uh, titled Some Guidelines for Conductive, Conducting Quantitative and Qualitative Research in TESOL. Again, I direct you to this article. It might seem a little old and dated, but there are some ideas there that still ring true today in 2024. About eight years ago, uh, as part of the 50th anniversary of TESOL Quarterly, Amma Mabuk and Brian Paltridge, two former editors of TESOL Quarterly, uh, they invited several of us to, to kind of revisit the Chappelle and Duff piece. And so what we did was uh, we ended up kind of updating that earlier article. So this is the same thing that you saw in the previous slide. These were the, the different authors. I'm there at the bottom, and I uh, one of my areas of research is ethics and applied linguistics. I wrote the section on ethics in TESOL research. So please, uh, be, uh, that's where you see, you know, that's a breakdown. Um, of course, I'm not. Many of us here work in different areas and different types of research, but we do have some information in that article on experimental research, survey research, ethnographic research, discourse analysis. Um, that's the piece I believe that Rodney Jones worked on, practitioner research. And, and, and then, of course, as I mentioned earlier, the part that uh, I authored the section on ethics, all right? So again, I strongly invite you to look up this piece. Uh, it does have some helpful information and which I'm also gonna talk about more extensively in the next few slides. But let me first give you an overview on what this whole publication process looks like, right? And of course, some of you might have some experience in getting your work published, but if you're here, I'm guessing that most of you are still relatively novice researchers, and you're trying to uh, navigate this um, very broad and perhaps somewhat opaque uh, terrain of publication. 
Okay, so I'm going to give you some pointers, which I hope that you'll find to be useful. And this is kind of the overview of what I'm going to be talking about for the next uh, few slides. So step one, you have to pick a journal. But then there's so many journals in the field today, right? Where do you, where do you even begin? Um, so I, I think what you need to take, do is take a step back and ask yourself some key questions. Who is going to be the audience of your article? All right. So, for example, if you're doing second language writing research, maybe one of the journals you want to target is the Journal of Second Language Writing, JSLW. Does that does that make sense? You know, your research is on L2 writing. You submit your manuscript to the Journal of Second Language. Uh, writing JSLW. So you need to think about who your audience is going to be. All right. And ask yourself, what type of article am I writing? Am I writing a feature article, which is basically what we would call an empirical study, right? Where you, you might have done a thesis or dissertation, but now you're going to have to reduce the key findings from that major piece of work to about, say, 7,000 to 10,000 words. Okay. Maybe then that's what you're, you'll be targeting a featured article. But if you remember the start of this presentation, I said there are different kinds of article categories. Like Tissot Quarterly has a brief report section. It also have a, has a research issues section where the work is about 3,400 words. Uh, in addition, to that there's a teaching issues se section. It's also about 3,400 words. So. You know, you might have this bigger piece, like a thesis or a dissertation, but you need to know how to figure out how to carve that and kind of move that around and, you know, submit it to different journals and to to kind of uh, reformulate your big um, publication uh, into smaller bits that are more specific, like, for example, research issues or teaching issues. So perhaps if you have very strong or compelling pedagogical implications in your study, you might say, I'm going to recast my the, the teaching aspects of my thesis or dis dissertation to, to work on a manuscript that I might want to then submit to the teaching issues section of TESOL Quarterly. Again, I'm using TESOL Quarterly as an example. There are so many applied linguistics journals out there. Go explore them and then study the types of articles that the journal publishes. Okay, and if you're not sure, go consult with your professor, right? They've been around longer, they should be able to give you some advice in terms of which journals to start with. Okay, so that's the third part there. What kinds of articles does the journal publish? What topics do they cover? Right, so if you're doing anxiety, for example, I think one of the things you want to figure out is when was the last time this journal published a study on anxiety? If they've not published a single article on that topic in the last 10 years, I think um, your intuition and common sense should tell you this is not going to be a good um, journal to send my work to. Okay, so I think familiarity with the journal, I'll say this a few times during the presentation this morning, is that you need to be immensely familiar with the journal and the audience of that journal. All right. So, for example, if you work in languages other than English, maybe you work in uh, the acquisition of Arabic, the acquisition of Chinese, right, for example, or the acquisition of Thai, you're not going to submit a paper to Tissot Quarterly because Tissot Quarterly looks at um, the, the, the learning and teaching of English. Right? So you know, you'd be surprised. I still, even after six years as the co-editor of Tissot Quarterly, I still occasionally get manuscripts being sent to us uh, on how to improve the teaching of French. And I'm like, this person has no idea what this journal is about. They randomly picked TESOL Quarterly and decided to send the manuscript to, to my journal. So please take the time and effort to learn about the journal, to study the journal. And specifically, I would say, look at the last five to 10 years of what the journal has published. Because a journal that might have published a topic 15 years ago might have moved away from the topic in the last five or 10 years. 
Okay. So, and of course, this is important to many of us, especially for those of us in highly competitive universities, right? The prestige level of the journal is important. And that's true, but at the same time, I want to be frank here and say, like, we all aspire to publish in the most prestigious journals, but maybe at this point of our career, we might not be ready for that journal. Right. So I'm not going to name journals, but, you know, I think you can figure out uh, either through your own detective work or consult consulting with your professors. Is this a tier one journal? Is this a tier two journal? Or is this a tier three journal? Right. All of us want to be in tier one, but maybe it might be another five or ten years before we get to the quality of a tier one manuscript. Right. And so be patient. In, in that sense. Or you might start, for example, sending a manuscript to a tier one journal and it gets rejected. But you get very, very valuable feedback. And you can use that feedback to re revise or rework that article and then maybe submit it to a tier two journal. And it might find a publication home at that journal in that sense. So, and if it and it's also rejected at a tier two journal, then you know, drop down to a tier three journal. If the goal is to get your work published, I think that's a, a very pragmatic uh, move to make, right? Sometimes some people get so discouraged, they're rejected by a tier one journal, they decide not to submit that manuscript to anywhere ever again. So that manuscript kind of dies with them, right? It never sees the light of publication. And I think that you've in a way squandered an opportunity to share your research with others, right? I think it's so important that your work goes out. It might not go out to the specific audience that you originally intended, but if it gets published in a, a, in a different journal of one that's different from your original choosing, it still is out there. Or if it doesn't get published in a journal, it could be recast as a book chapter. So it might reappear as a, um, a chapter in an edited volume. This happens, it's happened to me before as well. So, so this is where I want to circle back to the point I made earlier, where it's very important for you to network and to know exactly who's publishing what and when. And it's good for you to kind of make yourself known to to these people and to be on their radar, right? So if you're a person who works, for example, in language ideologies, you might want to know who's doing work or editing work on language ideologies in that respect and, and kind of make sure that they get to know you and your work too, okay? So now I'm moving on here and look at the time. Oh, I need to pick up the pace, right? So no, there are different journals. I'm going to use English as an example. We have Tiesel Quarterly, we have ELT Journal that's published by Oxford University Press. Both TQ and TJ are published by Wiley. And if you're a member of the Association for Alternate Linguistics, L, we, we do have a bit more information on journals that uh, you we have access to, but that's kind of like password and member protected. <laughs> okay, um, things to think about the prestige level, for example, the impact factor. But what I think is most important is please read the mission and the guidelines of the journal very, very carefully. I cannot overemphasize that. Okay, and as I said earlier, look at the last few years and see um, have they been publishing research that's kind of is comparable to yours? Very important, if you write a manuscript or you write a thesis or a dissertation and you never cite one single publication from that journal, to me, that's a good telltale sign that that journal is not a good fit for you. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> if, you've never, if you've never cited, for example, the Modern Language Journal, you know, never read a single article from the Modern Language Journal, Guess what? Your probably your work is probably not going to be best suited for the modern language journal, in that sense. Okay, so so start with that. Start with your own references list. When you look back on your thesis or your dissertation, which journal do I cite most frequently? That to me would be your number one choice, in that sense. Okay, um, uh, and vice versa. 
as an editor, when I receive a manuscript, one of the first things I do is I look at the references section of that manuscript and say, has this person actually cited any work from Tissot Quarterly? If this person hasn't, then I do question about how well does this author know my journal? Have they ever picked up a single issue of the journal and read TQ? Right? And and that to me again sets alarm bells off in my mind in, in that respect, right? Then this I have a strong suspicion that this person just randomly picked my journal, Tishon Quadley, and it's just um taking a stab in the dark and submitting a manuscript, hoping that maybe I will send it out for review in that sense. So I think it's very important that you analyze the again the genre of the journal, what type of um articles do they tend to publish? TQ tends to publish articles that have both theoretical and practical value. Uh, we're kind of a broad journal in the sense that uh, the range of topics is largely uh, is relatively large, for example. Um, but we do need to see and we do want to see how exactly is your research related to English language teaching. It doesn't make sense, right? It's too small quarterly in that in that respect. Or at least, to what extent does it have educational implications in that respect? If you're doing a language policy study, we do want to see how exactly your language policy article might be of value to the Tiso quarterly readership in that sense. So I'm I'm going through this relatively quickly, simply because um, you can read more about it from that piece that I mentioned earlier by Amar Mapup and colleagues, right? But for for those of you who are completely new to the process, so when you submit to a journal, you click on ready to submit, right? Your manuscript on and, and most journal art uh, websites are about the same. What happens then is it the the online system creates a pdf of your manuscript and three things could happen and it appears on the editor's desk like mine if i think that your piece is not gonna be of a good fit to tq you end up in the middle uh box there it gets desk rejected so that it never goes out for external review I do an immediate reject, okay? Uh, but if I think there is potential, then I send it out for full review. In other words, you get an external reviewer, or in fact, in my case, usually three external reviewers looking at your manuscript. And that's like you pass the first stage, okay? And, and very rarely, I get an article that I look at it and I'm thinking it has a lot of potential. It's like a diamond in the rough. And I, but I know if I were to send it out right now, it would probably be rejected. So on occasion, when I see um, a lot of potential of the manuscript, I send it back to the the author and say, work on X, Y, and Z first, and then resubmit. Very, very rare. Like in one or hundred manuscripts, if I ever do that, right? In that sense. Um, so in an ideal case. After it goes out for external review, your manuscript is accepted, but usually keep in mind it'll take about two or three rounds before it's accepted. Um, most of the time you get categories two, three, and four. It could be accepted for minor revisions, which which is also quite rare. Many of us aspire to be in category three, which is revise and resubmit. That means you're still in the game. You haven't been um removed entirely yet okay uh, and or it could be just reject in which case we say oh here are three sets of reviewer comments we all think that this manuscript is um not publication worthy but here are the here's the advice here are the recommendations please do what you want with it but things end here <laughs> right uh, you might want to uh, use the comments and perhaps revise the manuscript, but don't submit it to us. Submit to another journal in that sense. So, so that happens. And um, I talked about that earlier, and, and I said category three up there is not very common. Now, in the article by Mambu and colleagues 2016, uh, we put out a checklist that's used by TQ in terms of um, how to decide how to... Uh, I'm going to close this here.
um, do we do in-house review? Remember I mentioned desk reject, right? I'm not going to read this to you, but very quickly, I'm one of the things I'd be thinking about would be, is TQ the right channel, number one, number six, is it an original article, among other things, okay? So, I do want to say this, and I don't mean to sound overly harsh, but this is the reality. If I get a manuscript, and I think it's well written, that it's not highly original. The topic has been done to death, right? There's nothing new. I could, you could have done the study 25 years ago, and the findings would not have changed between now and then. We're using the same old theoretical framework. Then I, my, reply, my response would be, a desk reject. I write to you and say thank you. Uh, relatively well written, but it is not a study that's cutting edge. Maybe you want to consider another journal. Okay. And I know it's very hard to gauge that, right? And in that sense, and of course, people get very upset. They get very disappointed because they put in so much work in working on that manuscript. But I do then recommend alternate journals. I'm not going to recommend those journals to you right now. But uh, if that happens, I do try to redirect authors to other journals in that sense. Oops, are we going? Seems like we've frozen a bit. Let me see. Do we have our Okay. Where is the like, Okay. So let's kind of say um how exactly do you make it through the first gatekeeping function, right? Please make sure you have a good abstract because that's the first thing we see. Don't make a title that's so bizarre that it's 85 words. You know that after by the time we end, by the time we finish reading your app title, we're like, what is this title or study all about? Okay, so be concise, be clear, be catchy, right? Um, among other things, and you need to kind of show that you're part of a wider conversation in in that sense. Um, first, it's hard to predict what exactly the reader knows or doesn't know. If someone's very familiar with your work or your topic, yes, they will probably know more about it. But keep in mind that one of your goals should be also to entice new readers who might be new to your topic to want to read your article. Okay, so uh, so I'm going to give you several choices. Do you think title number one or number two here? The more specific it is, better. Right, so well, we you see that number two, you're using a corpus to correct lexical errors. Uh, the case of Chinese students is far more specific than just strategies in general. Okay, um, number one and number two. The one thing, problem well, number one is not everyone might know what TBC means, so don't use acronyms in your title, please. Okay, in that sense. Um, and well, that makes a good abstract. I'm not going to go on about how do you write a good abstract, but very broadly speaking, in about two to three hundred words, it would be helpful if you could cover these five moves, right? Give a little bit of background to the topic or phenomenon that you're investigating. Tell the reader what the purpose of your study is. Explain very briefly what methods you adopted. Report in two or three sentences what your findings were. And finally, close out your abstract with some implications. In the interest of time, I'm going to move forward. But I, I do want to show you that if you look at an abstract here, you can see the distribution, right? They're all color coded. Where you know there's a, a, by the way, this example has four out of the five. Uh, moves that I mentioned earlier. It has a little bit of method, it has a little bit of purpose, um, a summary of the findings, and a, a fair bit, uh, you know, it closes up the implications. That's a quantitative uh, article uh, in that sense. Um, not qualitative article. I do want to say there is no fixed formula, right, for writing abstract. But I think if you generally stick to the rule that you cover the basis, background, purpose, method, findings, and implications, 
UD36. And so my recommendation is read 5, 10, 15 abstracts and see how do these how are these abstracts written? To what extent do these abstracts cover these five broad moves, right? And then work backwards and and and, and uh, write your abstract within the word limit also. That's very important. Don't write a 500 word abstract. The online system will reject your abstract anyway. Writing a lit review is a workshop by itself. If you're taking a graduate methodology course, wherever you are, you know, you probably have had to work on your lit review sometimes a half a semester, a whole semester in that sense. But very briefly, I want to say don't just list studies, right? You need to synthesize and evaluate. And I really strongly, strongly recommend the book on the right here, uh, written by Teresa Lillis and Mary Jane Curry, A Scholar's Guide to Getting Published in English. Okay, so so site studies that you yeah. come back to later. Some people get excited; they want to go on this long, extended list of studies. Um, but then we never see those studies appear in the in the thesis or in the article ever again. So I think one good way to see which studies to eliminate is to think about the studies that you don't come back to later in the article. So th those are definitely dispensable. Okay. And I'm just citing these same studies that appear in your lit review um, in your conclusion or your discussion adds to the coherence of your article. Right? What you said before you return to later in the article. Okay. You synthesize the literature so it leads to to your research question and don't think that there's a gap uh your justification um your studies justified so let's say no one has done research on um this topic in Kiribati you know the first scholar from Kiribati to do it therefore is justifiable you know yes to some extent but then in and of, of itself wouldn't be a strong rationale. Okay, so what to cite? You know, citation is very political. You know, how far, far back do you go? I tend to like lit reviews that do reviews decade by decade. So a topic like motivation has been researched for 40, 50 years. So it's nice to say, you know, in the 50s and 60s, this was the focus on motivation, 60s and 70s, 80s and 90s, you know, and then you can kind of show how the field has evolved in relation to motivation, but you're going to be blocking yourself mostly in the motivation body of work in the last five to ten years. So the, the, the reader knows that you are aware of the rich body of research that's happened over time, but you're not going to spend too much of your time you know the old stuff right you're going to be focusing on the new stuff in in, in that sense um and very importantly i would say read meta-analysis read research reviews because they are gold mines for you right the, the, the efforts of these types of publications have already done the heavy lifting they've read everything that needs to be read about that topic don't reinvent the wheel piggyback on what they've done and use their work to your advantage, right? The references list that they have, amazing, right? Instead of creating your own references list, use their references list, you know, and, 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 and selectively pick things that are relevant to your study. Okay, and very importantly, please, if you're if you're working in applied linguistics, cite applied linguistics journals. Don't cite too many journals outside of the discipline because my first response would be you should submit your article to a psychology journal or you should submit your article to an education journal not this applied linguistics journal okay um please cite studies from international studies right yes it's okay to cite some local studies but keep in mind if the local studies are published in the local language let's we have to realize that only the people in your domestic environment would have read that research okay it's okay to have a few of those but i think it's important to have uh, work that's been cited and published in uh, international studies 
and international journals. Okay, and the definition of terms is very important. I would always recommend if you're a novice scholar, use someone else's definition. You can try to create a definition for yourself. I'm going to breeze through this. Um, we have quantitative guidelines uh, in TSO quarterly and what to look out for. Um, very quickly, you need to have a table of descriptive statistics. It's always nice to have data visualizations and to describe your instruments. If you're doing qualitative work, one of the things I always look out for is there a framework? Is there a rationale? How did you analyze your data? Give us an example. Give us a description of your analysis process. And increasingly, we do expect you to talk about your researcher positionality. You know, that's what your what's your personal relationship to the research site, to the topic, to your to your participants. Please don't plagiarize. I think this everybody would know. Uh, when you submit a manuscript to a journal like Tissot Quarterly, uh, we run it through Authenticate, and then we can figure out to one extent is it plagiarized. And so, and that also includes please don't plagiarize. Uh, against yourself. So you might have published in one article uh, in a one journal earlier and that the system will still capture if you're cutting and pasting cool sections or full paragraphs from your earlier publication. Okay, and so this is what it looks like when we run the manuscript to authenticate. If you look at the right, people can, we can figure out where did you get your information. This is quite good, right? Two, one, one percent, less than one percent. So this person is not plagiarizing very, very much. Okay. But if we have 20, 25 percent, that again sets alarm bells off. Okay. Um, criteria for external reviewing. So let's say your work goes out to an external reviewer. What happens? Uh, they have about six weeks to review your piece. Uh, they look at these criteria, among other things. They don't necessarily answer each question at a time because an experienced reviewer would immediately be able to figure out, for example, number two, is the problem significant and is it concisely stated, for example. Okay. Um, that's from the article. I'm sorry, again, I'm not going to talk about it in great detail. I direct you to that uh, uh, piece by Mark and colleagues, 2016 Tison Quarterly. What's really important is when you do get to that stage that you have the fortune of having the comments from reviewers, please read those comments very carefully, right? Don't just dismiss those comments. Remember, reviewers do this on their own time. They're volunteers. They have taken four or five hours to read your article. So take those comments seriously. And you don't always have to do what they say. I would say maybe 80, 85, 90% of your comments you should try to try to comply with, right? But if you there are some things that you disagree with, you certainly are entitled to disagree with them. But you need to have a strong rationale. All right. So a strong rationale could come to the fact that you can say this other person did the study in 2017 and those these were their findings. Their findings contradict what you are saying. And so that's where you can counter what the reviewer might be asking you to do. Many people don't realize this, but you can, when you resubmit your manuscript, write a cover letter, like a summary of what you've done, the changes that you've made, okay? Uh, and, and send that to your editor. Your edit, the editor tends to read the cover letter very carefully. The editor's not going to have time to read your 10,000 word article all over again, right? So they will pay very close attention to your highlights in the, that will appear in your cover letter in that sense. And if they give you three months to revise and resubmit, try to work within that time frame. If, for example, you have a genuine reason, let's say you are in ill health or you had an accident, okay, and you need more time, if you write to the editor ahead of time and say, can you give me an extra month? Most of the time, I'm pretty sure they will be generous. If the article is due tomorrow and then the day before you're writing them and say, can you give me more time? It's not going to go down very well, right? That, that does not reflect very well on you. Okay. Uh, and so most of the time, we tend to resend your manuscript to the same set of reviewers. It doesn't always happen that 
let's say I send it to three reviewers, that all three reviewers will say yes to to rereading your original piece. Maybe one or three will say yes. So there's possibility sometimes that in your revision um, phase, at your revision phase, you might get another reviewer who is new. Okay, it does happen. So, and it also takes a long time to get reviewers. Keep in mind, as I said, reviewers are very busy professors themselves. They're not getting paid. So sometimes it can take me two months just to get three reviewers for one manuscript. So keep in mind, be patient. The whole process can take anywhere between six to nine months. It could even take over a year in some extreme cases. Um, so again, going back to the Chisong Quarterly article, please make sure that you follow a submission checklist uh, that might be stipulated. Some journals actually have their own submission checklist, so observe the checklist items very carefully. Um, well, yet yeah, to a reviewer's perspective, I need to move a little faster. Yeah. So now let, let me put myself in the shoes of a reviewer. So this was a screenshot that I did several years ago. I was a reviewer for this journal called System, right? My name you can see there, reviewer number one. And then after I read, read the manuscript, after having read the manuscript, I have to choose several things of a menu. Can you see the box towards the bottom with the tick? Okay. I can either say accept as is, I can say revise and resubmit, or I could also go all the way to the bottom and say not recommended for publication. So the reviewer has this uh, authority to decide where do we go from here in that sense. And um, most journals will provide instructions to the reviewer. They might not be identical, but they're more or less the same, right? To comment on the uh, overall quality of the scholarship, what do they, they think about the methods and so and so and so forth, okay? Uh, but this is interesting. You don't get to see this. After a review co completes their review, they have this option to also share their personal confidential comments to the editor. So most of the time, it's the same thing. The comments that go out to the author are mirror images of the comments that go out to the editor. But sometimes I do get a different set of comments from the reviewer to say, I really think there's a lot of potential in this article. I encourage you to give the, this new author a chance, you know, and be patient with them because there's something really good there, right? Well, the reviewer might say to me privately, I couldn't decide whether to reject or, or suggest major revisions. I'm on the fence here. And then they'll say, you decide, Peter, to reject or you decide major revisions. Okay, And that's not always clear because they might have a whole bunch of recommendations or comments to the author. But usually, if you can also figure this out yourself, right? If you get six pages of comments, obviously, you, there are serious issues with your manuscript. Okay? And if you're going more towards reject than just major revisions. So, so I'm just telling you those things to let you know what goes on. You saw the slide earlier, but I want to re emphasize that, you know, uh, do write a cover letter to the editor. Okay, if you say you've made these changes, be very clear and highlight what you've done to the editor. So we moved from editor's perspective, reviewer's perspective. Uh, the last section is not very long, an author's perspective, right? And Christoph mentioned that I've published um, a fair bit over the last 10 years, 15 years, I guess, if we go back to when I was a PhD student. Uh, and this is a repeat of what I've said so far. Be very, very familiar with the website of the journal that you're submitting your manuscript to. Okay, you saw this earlier. Get to know who's on the editorial board. So imagine if I'm submitting an article to TESOL Quarterly. Uh, there's much more than this, right? This is only the top part of the um, website. Underneath this, if you go to our website, you will have about 25 names of different editorial board members. If you look at the list of editorial board members and you don't recognize most of them, guess what? 
that probably means this is not a journal for you. <laughs> because and why am I saying this? Because editors tend to send manuscripts to people on the editorial board. So if you've never read the work, you don't have to read the work of all 25 members of the board either, right? Because the board is made up of scholars who have different areas of interest. But you need to be able to see if the board members um, have similar interests to you. Okay, in that sense. And that's again a good indication of, is this the right journal for my work? Okay. Um, so I'd say things that I've said before is get familiar with the last five, ten years of the, of the journals. What have they published? And if I'm submitting an article, I would say these are the three possible journals I can envision my manuscript being published in. It could be journal X, it could be journal Y, it could be journal Z, right? So let's say I think my first choice is journal X. It's rejected. I revise and resubmit, and now I target journal Y. Now, it shouldn't have to be a radical revision because in my original manuscript, I probably cited a few studies from journal Y. Maybe journal Y also rejects you. You're down to journal Z. Okay, but in your original manuscript, you probably had a few articles cited from Journal Z too, right? So you need to kind of know from the very start uh, what are three possible journals. Of course, I wish and hope that all of you get to publish in your journal um, or your first choice journal. But the fact is, it doesn't always happen. The fact is, in fact, most of the time it doesn't happen. Okay, so so rank them from one through three. But keep in mind. Keep in mind, if you are in a hurry, you're in a time crunch to get your work published. If your first choice is the most prestigious journal in the field, and they take nine months to get back to you, and the decision at the end of nine months is they reject. In your 10th month, you are back to square one. You have to start the whole process again with journal Y. And if the same thing happens, General Y rejects, another 10 months pass, and you submit to General Z. That's already one and a half years. So I would say be very pragmatic and say, if I really wanted to get this published, maybe I shouldn't be targeting the most prestigious journal. Maybe I might just start with uh, a mid-level tier two journal to begin with. Yeah, but if time is on your side, by all means, <laughs> go from X to Y to Z. Okay, yeah, you have to miss. Okay, but also I want to say, remember I said when I get a manuscript, I always look at the references section. Has that person cited articles from Tisal Quarterly? So please make sure if you're submitting an article to language and education, for example, that you cite three or four articles from language um, uh, and education. And Christoph, you were saying that. Um, the book has been uh, accepted by language, culture, and curriculum, right? If you're submitting an article to that LCC, make sure you do submit a few, either you do cite a few articles from LCC. It just makes sense, right? Um, I'm going to close out here right now by kind of repeating what I've said so far. Um, you saw this earlier when I, when I introduced the different sets of editors at TESOL Quarterly to you. Just know that there are different article genres, right? It could be a feature article, it could be a brief report. Each journal is different. Not, and every journal does more than just feature articles, okay? As I said earlier, brief reports, research issues, teaching issues, they can be shorter. They're only like 3,400 words versus 8,500 words for a feature article, okay? So go and look at past issues of the journal and see what does the teaching issues piece look like? What does the research issues piece look like? Read the author guidelines carefully because sometimes some of these other article categories are by invitation only, or they might say you have to approach the section editor first. So it's different from the feature articles where everybody can submit. Okay, um, but you saw partly, for example, Teaching issues, you need to reach out to our 
teaching issues editor Luciana de Oliveira and say, hey, I'm interested in this. Do you think it's a good fit for this section? Okay, so at the time, read the guidelines very carefully, know exactly what instructions they are giving uh, the authors. And again, read five, ten examples of that specific genre. If you want to do a brief report to see how have other authors who published in that journal written their brief reports. Okay. Um, there are different journals. I mean, I'm on the editorial board of this journal, Language Teaching, published by Cambridge University Press. You can see that it has a different set of article types that are listed in the bullets on the left. Okay, like state of the art articles, research timelines, research in progress. So each journal has its own specific type of article types that they publish. So my advice is be familiar with each journal, with multiple journals, and then figure out which article type might be best suited for you. Okay. I've said this many times, I, again, I, I think it's worth repeating. Always read the author guidelines. So I'll give you a very quick flavor of, I'm going to drink a bit of water, sorry. Of the different types of articles that are out, uh, different types of publications that are out there. You know, I've, I've done a fair range of publications. I've done the feature article, which is what most of us would be doing. I've done the research issues article as well. I've done teaching issues, you know, with my former student, uh, Dustin Crowther. Um, I've done a review article. You can see that the journals are changing, right, from slide to slide. I published in different journals as well. Um, this is, was a, a thinking aloud piece. I've done special issues. I've guest edited special issues. And this is another guest edited special issue. And I've even done featured article in the special issue that I've guest edited too. But I think I don't worry about the editing part because if you're just starting out right now, you're not going to probably be editing a special issue at, at this stage of your career. And then if you, if you edit the special issue, you get to write the introduction to the special issue. So that's a different article genre again. Or you get to write the commentary to the special issue too. You know, and this morning before I came, I posted on TerraRx um, that my commentary on ethics and applied linguistics, just hot off the press, um, has been published in a journal called Research Methods in Applied Linguistics. So in the commentary, I, I read six articles that were part of a special issue and offered comments. So um, to kind of sum things up here, if you're like a master's student, you might want to start by writing a book review. Okay, this is usually a short thing, a thousand to a thousand five hundred words, and you get published um, in, in, in some journals. I did this a number of years ago um, for Ingrid Miller's book, and this big book review was published in Language and Society. Some of you might want to convert your dissertation or thesis into a monograph, as I did. Or you might want to work on edited volumes, as I have as well. Um, I've also done chapters. So I, I've kind of given you the whole range because I just need you to know that there are different ways to get published. Okay. And to kind of close, I want to say what's a, what are some additional advice would I offer you? I would say go to how to get published sessions at conferences, sign up for workshops. For example, it could be a very specific workshop workshop on how to do how to write a lit review okay or read new methodology books there are always new books on the market don't be citing a methodology book that's 25 years old for example and then join listservs to get uh, uh, latest updates as well so you can join the listserv here like linguist list for instance or some of you might be familiar with this this is a digest that I 
put out with the help of my editorial assistant, uh, Carlo Sineglia. So every week, it's free to subscribe, right? And at the very top is the link for you to subscribe. You need to go to the link, scroll down, put your name, put your email address, and then you'll, you'll start getting weekly uh, newsletters. And so a newsletter like ours does three things. It tells you about coming conferences. It tells you about the latest publications in the field. And the last thing it does, it tells you about jobs that are available on the market. Three things, right? Conferences, publications, jobs. And it's free to subscribe. So um, I, I would suggest this is one of many examples where you can join a list of and get free updates. So for example, there might be a call for a book on language anxiety. And then you say, that's my topic. And it's an open call. I want to submit an abstract a proposal to the editor. If, you, if you're not part of a listener, you'll never know who's doing this call, right? It's, it'll be just like word of mouth. So you need to be plugged into different communities to know what's happening, right, in, in that sense. Um, so there we are. I think I went a bit over time. I want to say thank you very much for your attention. If you are interested in my work, highlighted in yellow is a link to my academic.edu site. You can have access to my publications. But feel free to also follow me on Twitter. That's my Twitter handle or my X handle uh, at Peter I. DeCosta G. Right. Thanks very much. I'm going to take a sip of water and uh, let Christoph screen the questions that might have come through on the chat. I'm going to stop sharing at this point. Okay. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, what an interesting talk. Yeah. And I think um, really, really valuable insight. Yeah into into the the many worlds of publishing mm -hmm. yeah um i i we've got already a couple of questions but maybe i'll start with one mm -hmm. um because it, it's something that i've um kind of seen a lot of people thinking about and um you know there's a little seminars going on now mm. um about how to publish and i think there's there's always a tricky balance people try to strike between attention to form mm -hmm. you know getting the genre part of the article right the thing that we also teach in academic writing classes yeah. right how to you know cite properly and all this stuff mm -hmm. in relation to the issue that we're writing about mm -hmm. you know and you mentioned being part of a conversation yeah which i think is really is, is a good way to think about it right like what are you actually contributing to mm -hmm. can you maybe talk a bit about as an editor, right? How do you balance those two perspectives? You know, the form one versus the the issue side. Okay. You know? Well, I would say the issues always trump everything else, right? You need to be writing about a topic that's of value and significance. So, as I mentioned earlier, don't pick a topic that's dated. It will immediately go into the desk reject pile, in my perspective, right? So, novelty, originality. How cutting edge is this topic? Or it could be how cutting edge is this methodology? You might be looking at an old topic that's been around for a while, but you're you're experimenting with this very fascinating new methodology that's rigorous. So it's not some methodology you decided to create out of thin air, right? But maybe this is a methodology that's been used perhaps in educational psychology for example, but it's new to applied linguists. And you're kind of borrowing and but you're also at the same time modifying it from this adjacent discipline. And, and that's like going to increase the novelty value of your work, right? Uh, that's important. Uh, form matters, right? Because number one, it still needs to be accessible to our readership. So if it's not written in the right register and it's like, linked with grammatical errors. I hate, I don't want to sound like the language police here. It's not going to reflect very well on you, the author, right? So I would say, um, do make sure you do some kind of editing. Having said that, I'm also aware that the field is evolving. Applied linguistics is by itself a transdisciplinary field. So in the last few years, for example, we've seen a lot of 
auto ethnographies being published. Now, an auto ethnography is not going to fall into that very set format where you have introduction methods, uh, participants, framework, discussion, right? That's that they kind of fits more of a positivist uh, kind of approach to research. All right. But I, we don't need to create wiggle room and uh, acknowledge the fact that different methodologies ultimately lend themselves to different presentation formats and styles. Okay. And, and, and that's where I think, um, again, you need to be familiar with that new format and style in that respect. How are the people doing autoethnographies, for example? Okay, and I can say that there is no hard and fast rule in terms of how to write to ethnography, which is good and bad, right? For people who want structure and say, give me the template, I want to stick to the template. I'm sorry, in this case, a template doesn't exist, okay? But you don't have to be a good, compelling writer to be able to capture the attention of your reader if you're doing an, an autoethnography. So form matters, but at the same time, without sounding evasive here, form is also open to a fair bit of interpretation depending on the methodology, for example, that you're using. Now, you might get a reviewer who is a true, I mean, I would never do this, but I would never send an autoethnographic study to someone who does lab-based research. It makes no sense for me to send, for example, an autoethnography to a hardcore psycholinguist in, in my field, right? Because that person's going to say, what kind of study is this? You know, it's number one, miss the data. <laughs> because we all have different interpretations on what constitutes data, right? Epistemologically, we might not see eye to eye. So I would certainly then send a manuscript to someone who's done autoethnography for sure, right? And he's going to give you a little bit of um, lunch and, and a fair bit of license to be a bit more experimental with the writing. It still needs to have substance though, right? And it's, please don't, it's not all about form, right? It does still need to contain content. It needs to be contemporary content. It needs to be abreast with the field within applied linguistics and across adjacent disciplines as well. So, so many things that are going on here. Um, but, but what's the solution? My solution is go read other articles that have been published that are kind of similar to the study that you're reporting and try to emulate those writing styles then you'd be relatively safe. Keep in mind that there's still some room for you to uh, insert your own creativity and innovation, but it won't be too extreme, okay? Um, you're at the stage of your career. If you're this major um, celebrity applied linguist, you know, people are going to cut you a little bit more slack later in your career, but now if you're just starting out, you kind of need to play um, as closely to the rules of the game as possible. If you want to get published. Okay. Right. Um, we've got a couple of questions on Zoom in the, in the chat about mm -hmm. language errors, and then there's one related. Mm -hmm. So one is how to eliminate language errors. Are there any tools or platforms? Mm -hmm. And there's then one um, that asks also about the use of AI tools like ChatGPT for proofreading. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wonder why. Okay. Sort of a question. Yeah. What do you think about that as a bit? So maybe I'll start with the second one about AI, right? I mean, all journal editors are aware that chat GPT is out there. We don't want to see it as the enemy. We'd like to give it the benefit of a doubt and acknowledge that it's a very, very valuable resource, especially to colleagues for whom English is not the first language, right? So increasingly journals are asking uh, authors to kind of sign off as kind of like a declaration to disclose that if you have used um, AI tools like ChatGPT to be upfront and transparent, okay? General editors also want to preserve the integrity of research. That's very important to us. But at the same time, 
most of us, not just the editor, when they read the text, they can kind of tell whether it's been written um, by the author, if it's like been mass, you know, mass cobbled <laughs> and by, by, by a chain for example right so I, I think it'd be good to err on the side of caution and say yes i have used chat gpt and this is where i've kind of used it you know but if you can't be bothered to even edit your own work then you have it your own peril right chances are it's going to be desk rejected if it sounds very very uh stilted and, and we know that it wasn't you the writer but some chat bot that was writing it okay so so that's one thing now Alice, um i would say if possible try to get um some proofreading done maybe by friends or colleagues uh if you feel that grammar is maybe not your strongest suit in that sense that's what i would do try to uh, engage the assistance uh, for these other individuals Alternatively, I would say, think about co-authorship. It's always good, maybe at the start of your career, to think about co-authoring a piece with a senior scholar. And that could be your advisor. It could be your dis dissertation chair. It could be your MA thesis reader, whomever. <laughs> okay? But if, if you're just starting out, if you've never been published before, right, I think there's a lot of value to co-authoring with someone who has had experience and who will be in a very good position for example to offer you guidance so for, so let's say for example you get feedback from three reviewers and each reviewer writes six pages of comments and then you're reading through 18 pages of comments and trying to figure out where do i begin to respond to the reviewers and to revise your manuscript a more seasoned co-author would be able to figure out what to respond to and what to kind of overlook in that sense. And so you don't want to be completely overwhelmed at that stage. And so that's why I think it's important that you partner someone who has a bit more experience. Having said that, I am a strong believer if the data in that study came from your thesis or your dissertation, you need to be the first author. Ethically, it's your data, even if the second co-author is your advisor or someone more senior who's also giving you a lot of guidance, you should still be acknowledged as the first author. And I think you will learn a lot also if you are the corresponding author. Because as a novice researcher, one thing one of the things you need to learn to do is how to communicate with the editor how do you communicate with the journal because if the senior person does everything you're not going to learn very much <laughs> okay you're doing the revisions with the assistance of your senior colleague and along the way during that process you're also learning what to do and what not to do and that's the model I keep, this apprenticeship model that I keep with my own doctoral students, right? And so many of whom, after a few articles or publications with me, they're working on single authored pieces themselves, and they've already figured out how to deal with journal editors on their own. And then when that happens, I feel, I think I've done, I've done my job as the advisor. Okay. Great. Great. Um, can I ask, um, in Zoom, would anyone like to um, speak out and ask a question? If yes, can you raise your hand, please? Did anyone want to ask a question? Oh, yes, please. There's someone here in, in, the, in the room. Yes. Uh, thank you, Professor, for the talk. It's very uh, insightful and very helpful. Sure. And I was wondering, uh, from your experience as, uh, as an editor, uh, mm. what criteria do you use to choose uh, reviewers for a manuscript? Mm. Okay, that's a good question. So usually, as I said before, when I look at a manuscript, my eyes always go to the references section. Who is this person citing? Let's say you are, I keep coming back to motivation because I think that's a topic that many people like, right? And he's no longer with us, sadly, Zoltan Donier. 
passed a few years ago, right? But if you cite Zoltan Donye's work a lot, my my first thought would be, why not ask the master himself to read your manuscript? Because, uh, because, and sometimes you may think they're very busy, but some senior scholars do not like it when their work is misinterpreted by novice scholars, because they may have written something, but as the as the new uh, emerging scholar, you might in their perspective have misinterpreted their work and so they want to set the record straight and and they might then read your work right uh, but then if say uh the late uh, um, uh zoltan donia is that wrong i think well he's had so many successful students who've, who've worked with him the second generation of motivation scholars i go for them right because they don't know the work quite well and when you work with a professor, you, you probably would have figured out what is uh, a sound understanding of their work, right, in that sense. So that, that's one thing. I, I, I tend to typically go for people who are aligned and are familiar with your construct, your framework, whatever, okay? And then I would also then look at a methodologist. So, for example, if you're an, it's an ethnographic piece of work, I will say I'll go and look for someone who does ethnography. And they can evaluate on the form part of it, going back to Christoph's question, right? Is this ethnographic? Uh, does it do ethnographic justice, right, to the methodology? And they might then offer some very helpful feedback on how the piece can be revised. And sometimes I might just go with someone who is a generalist. So someone who doesn't know the topic very well. And I say, can you just read it, please, and see if it makes sense to you? Because if I, if I pick an expert who is so familiar with the content, for instance, that person will be able to understand all your jargon. But someone who is a generalist will be able to say, I have no idea what you're saying here. This term this needs to be defined, that term needs to be defined and unpacked for the reader. So that's why I also value um, a, a kind of a generalist. Uh, and I would say clearly, you don't need to know the topic very well, right? Just read it and, and tell me what you think about clarity and accessibility of this manuscript. Um, because Chiso Hotelli has a wide readership and then also has an international readership, right? So I need to think about um, how accessible is the manuscript going to be to a wide audience in that sense. So, and so I use a combination of these choices in, in, in that respect as I decide who to invite. But of course, having said that, I might invite some people and they certainly have the right to decline my invitation and that happens more often than not for whatever reason be they're busy or um they might say i have a conflict of interest even though the author's name is not mentioned i know who the author is uh because i saw him present this at the conference last month you know and and they might say i don't think it can be anonymously reviewed in this sense because I know who the author is and they on their own they, they say sorry um, I can't do the review right so then I have to go back to the drawing board and figure out who's going to be this person's replacement and as I mentioned earlier sometimes this can happen multiple times and so it could take me as long as three four months just even to get to the stage where I have three reviewers covered so review one might have finished the work but you know, their review might have come in two months ago, and I'm, but I'm still waiting for reviewer three, whom I found much later, to submit their review, right? And so that's why the months add up, the time, you know, in an ideal situation, all three people I approach say yes, all three people finish their review in six weeks, you get the sheet tag, great. But that's not the, that's not the norm, right? Uh, the norm is usually it gets stretched out the entire uh, review process. You just have to be patient, that's all. Okay, great. Um, just a reminder, yeah, if you're on Zoom and you want to ask, you've got to, you know, put your hand up, use the, use the reaction, yeah, so that I know that you want that. But I'll do another one from the chat in the meantime. Um, 
there's there's i think a really pressing one here about if you're an early career scholar mm -hmm. who doesn't have access to literature mm -hmm. to to so quarterly for example or others mm -hmm. also at some institutions we don't have access mm -hmm. what's what's if you end up using sci-hub yeah mm -hmm. so accessing illegally mm -hmm. You know, does that does that matter? Can the editor see this? Mm -hmm. But maybe um, on top of that, mm -hmm. also a question about uh, article processing charges. Um, whether um, the, a lot of journals around now um, who offer publication um, with uh, you know the appropriate charge. Um, what would be your perspective on that? So I want to say upfront, Tison Quarterly is not a editor publisher. <laughs> general right well, in that sense so it's not like oh you pay us three thousand dollars we'll make sure your article is published we're not that at all right so we go through a very systematic and rigorous process so um but having said that i would say be very careful about which publisher you approach right because everyone else knows that they are a for-profit publisher and your work is not going to be well received because essentially they know you bought your publication you know, it it didn't go through the legitimate and uh, rigorous process that it ought to have gone through, right? So keep that in mind. Don't waste your money, you know. But again, each person's situation is different. I don't know how pressured you are to get the work published. And in terms of access, um, all journals do have at least the contents of the article out. You might not. I mean, it's a big issue. I will not go there today. I do know that there are paywalls that prevent people from accessing the content of journals, right? And that, of course, for a, month, for a fee, you can always pay the publisher to access. It could be $35 to, do one, to, to have access to one article. That's a lot of money, right? And if you have 20 articles you need to access, that's, you know, that's already $700 US just getting to the articles themselves. Um, but I would say do figure out what are the latest contents for the journal so before I forget, I, I want to say like each journal allows you to sign up for an alert list of emails. So if the latest issue of a journal comes out and you subscribe to that list for the journal, it will automatically notify you that volume seven issue five has just been released. So you know that's new. And then you go and click on that, and you see, oh, this is article by this person and this person, person. How can we anything beyond the abstract? Because the abstract is free, right? But it stops there. I think most of us in the field understand and uh, the predicament of colleagues who don't have access to certain journals. And I've had many situations where colleagues from the global south say my university doesn't subscribe to journal x that you've published in would you mind sharing a pdf of your article with me and i never say no right i mean it doesn't cost me more than two minutes to retrieve my pdf and email that person and i would say again most of us we, we share that same sentiment okay but i increasingly i've also my work on platforms like academic edu and if you remember that's how i ended up my presentation just now by directing you to my academic.edu site many many scholars have comparable sites it might be through researchgate for example where they park their work so i would then kind of find a where their work might be residing, right? In that sense, um, it's a lot more work. I will really acknowledge to say it's a, a a lot more effort in being able to go to your library website. And as I have the privilege of that, I have to say I am very fortunate to be in a research university. And if my it's like maybe five percent of the time I can't access a certain article or book. I send an email to the librarian at my university and say, hey, can you get it for me? And within five to seven days, sometimes within a day, 
I get a PDF sitting in my folder waiting in that sense. And, and I know that I'm very lucky to have that option. But there are ways to get around this lack of access, right? So, so think about how you might be able to access the work of certain scholars. Uh, and, and you know, it's still the benefit of scholars to make their work available. I mean, all of us do research with the intent to share our findings. Like, why waste our time doing research if we want to keep the findings to ourselves, right? We want as many people to be able to find out about our research and to learn about our findings. So, so I can't imagine someone saying, no, I don't want to share my work with you, you know? No, they might say that if it hasn't been published yet. If they're still working on their manuscript, I can respect that, right? But if it's already out there, um, I would say 99% of the time, they will say, here it is. Um, you're most welcome to read my chapter or article. Hmm. Yeah, I can absolutely confirm this. Yes. Whenever there's, we, I haven't had access to anything or with, with my students, mm -hmm. um, unless your unless the email ends up in a spam box for some reason yeah. you'll get a reply where people say because people want to have their work read as you said right yeah mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah the issue of predatory journals that you mentioned i mean this is really a, a pressing thing now there was another question in the comments um about you know if a journal is offering you publication what does it mean i think probably we'd agree if it's if it's a journal's offering you something yeah it's probably a bad sign. Yes. Yeah, yeah. There's no free lunch in the world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah. there is. But mm. this is the other question. I think it's important for us to clarify, mm. right? I don't know. You might have to tell us how many percent of TESOL quarterly authors, if you've got the number in your mind, mm -hmm. publish without paying any fee? Yeah. So, of course, sometimes they, they might have open access. Yeah. Uh, and their university is sponsoring that in that, yeah. in that respect. Um, we do not give uh, we've had authors i've had authors right right come to me and say hey can you make my my journal article open access and no uh, we can't you, you know if you want it you pay the two three thousand dollars uh yourself or you ask your oh, it, it could be because you might have a big grant and this study came out of the grant that uh, you were able to secure then use your grant money to make their article open access in that sense so um, I mean, there's a whole debate going on about open access publication in that, in that area. I do want to make a plug, though. So my colleague Luke Ponsky is now the editor of an open access series of books. So, um, and my former student, I'm very happy to say, Matt Kessler and his colleague, um, Elliot um, Casal, have a new book out. Um, if you just Google them or look them up, it's and it's an excellent book because the book was written for graduate students and novice applied linguists. So it's free, it's open access. Um, and the name is Matt, Matthew or Matt Kessler, K E S S L E R, and Elliot E L I O T T Casal, C A S A L. It's a wonderful resource to have. If you're a graduate student or uh, an emerging scholar, go read that book. It's free and it's the first uh, of, a, of a series of books that uh, Luke Bonsky is going to be looking on as the series editor. Yeah, uh, this is really important. It's, it's a real tension now in publishing. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, I think culturally here, the reason why I asked about the number mm -hmm. is I, I would guess that vast majority of people publish in TESOL quarterly without without any fee, right? The okay. only ones that do have usually a big, big funding behind them yes. that allows them to pay right. like three, 3,000 US mm -hmm. for, yeah. for open access. And yeah. this is important. Mm -hmm. when in Southeast Asia, we can see some perfectly legitimate journals that charge a small fee because very often they're they're institutionally based, right? right? They're, they, they need maybe some support to keep working, right? Mm -hmm. That's those are perfectly legitimate journals. They still do proper review, right? Mm -hmm. There's and the fee tends to be small, mm -hmm. right? For international journals, ninety nine percent of the time, publication is free unless you want it to be open access, right? Yeah, yeah. and that's that's very important because I I do observe I have to say people sometimes thinking that oh you have to pay for every publication mm -hmm. and that's not the case. Yeah. yeah? No, I mean. 
no again i mean all of us are in it not to make money but to to share our research yeah yeah Brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Any? Is there any final question from Zoom? We haven't. We haven't had anyone ask. <laughs> no, we haven't had any any question from from uh, any participant in Zoom. But I think we've had plenty. We've heard plenty. Um... I'm, I'm gonna just share my screen one more yeah. time because in case people want, didn't get my academic.edu exactly. yes. uh, link, uh, there it is. Do have a look, um, and in general, I mean the advice to keep track of academia.edu, keep track of ResearchGate mm. um, to find uh, to find people publishing recent work. It really is very important. Yeah, yeah. I do want to just point out um, if you attended the talk from yesterday, it was recorded. Mm. Um, if you attended today's talk, it was recorded. Both recordings will be out on YouTube, so if you missed any part of it, everyone knows everyone's busy. Um, you can. If you just look for Peter's name on YouTube, you'll be able to find it in a couple of days. Um, if you're um, connected to, if you're connected to me on Facebook, I'll I'll share the link and we'll also share it in some groups. Or if you want to receive the link through your email, um, um, you can either if you've record if you've registered for the talk, you'll receive the the link automatically. Or if you write to me at my email, which you can find in the chat. Um, you will also get the recording. Okay. Otherwise, you can also just Google Christoph Sowski, my name, mm. and you will find me. You will find me, and you can email me that way. Okay. Right. I think then we conclude well, today. Well, thank you, Christoph, and thank you all. Um, we have we have one hundred seven. That's quite a good number. I know that some people had to leave for some reason or other, but that's a that's very very encouraging number. So thank thank you, 107 of you on Zoom. And um, perhaps our paths will cross at some point or other. And I do want to go back to the, what I have on the screen and say good luck with your research. And, um, and thanks again for spending uh, time with me this morning. Take care. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.